I'm Abby, and tonight we have Sleep Tight Tiny Animals. It was early morning in Sleepy Forest, and the sun was just beginning to rise over the horizon. The woodland animals were still fast asleep, snug in their beds. Apart from one. Adrenaline the tortoise was already awake. He'd woken up early because he liked filling his day with activities. There was always something to do, and always something to see. He got out of bed and had a good stretch. He washed his face and brushed his teeth. He put on his running shoes. They had blue stripes down the side of them, and Adrenaline was certain the stripes made him go faster. He left his little house and walked as fast as a tortoise could down the lane. He heard the light chattering of birds nearby and knew they were getting ready to begin their dawn chorus. Adrenaline loved joining in with them. Adrenaline waved to a robin who was perched on a fence and quietly practicing her latest tune. A group of wrens were sitting on the bough of a tree and fluffing up their feathers in readiness for the morning symphony to start. Adrenaline climbed onto a small rock and joined a goldfinch who was already sitting there. They gave each other cheery good mornings before getting ready to sing. A rooster with a plume of purple tail feathers stepped forward regally. He cleared his throat and brought the light chattering to a stop. He bowed his head in greeting and then nodded at the gathering of feathered singers and the tortoise. The singing began. The tune was light and carefree. It drifted over the forest and gently woke the animals who were stirring from their sleep. Adrenaline didn't know any of the words to the song, but he sang as loudly as he could and with as much enthusiasm as he could. He even had a little dance. Soon the song came to an end. The birds wished each other a joyful day before flying away in different directions. Adrenaline climbed off the rock and went on his way. He hastened through the forest, his little legs going as fast as they could. He called out, good morning, to everyone he saw. He soon came to a company of caterpillars who were searching the ground for fallen leaves. Adrenaline asked if they needed help. The biggest caterpillar said, Yes, please. We need as many leaves as we can. We're always hungry lately, and we need to eat all day long. The little tortoise began to gather leaves from beneath the trees. He took them back to the caterpillars, who began to munch on them immediately. They invited Adrenaline to stop for a while, and eat some leaves too. He politely said no. He could see how hungry the caterpillars were. He wanted to make sure they had plenty to eat. So whilst the caterpillars were enjoying their leafy feast, Adrenaline continued collecting more and more leaves. He brought the collection back to the caterpillars and put them in a neat pile. The caterpillars thanked the tortoise and said they had plenty to eat now. Adrenaline went on his way looking for something else to do. The sun rose higher in the sky, and the gentle heat felt soothing on Adrenaline's shell. He continued walking through Sleepy Forest, going as fast as a tortoise could go. Adrenaline came to a flower meadow and saw some frogs leaping joyfully through the grass as they travelled from one side of the meadow to the other. They looked like they were having a wonderful time. Adrenaline gave them a cheery wave. The frogs 
invited him to join them. Adrenaline didn't hesitate. He moved closer to the frogs and watched how they bent their legs before jumping into the air. He did a few practice hops and then followed the frogs through the meadow. He jumped as high as a tortoise could jump. The frogs said he was doing really well. They asked him to join them at the pond, where they were going to jump from lily pad to lily pad. Adrenaline wasn't sure about that, and admitted all the jumping had made him a little tired, and he wasn't sure he had any hops left in his legs. And besides, he still had plenty of things to do, and plenty of things to see. Adrenaline said goodbye to the frogs, and carried on walking his steps a little slower now. The sun moved across the sky some more. Birds sang sweetly from the treetops. A fox with fur the colour of autumn leaves strolled leisurely through the grass. Deer nuzzled at hedgerows that were sprinkled with ripe red berries. Adrenaline noticed some bushy-tailed squirrels scampering up and down a sycamore tree. He waved cheerfully to them and asked what they were doing. Collecting nuts, they replied. We need as many as we can. Adrenaline offered to help them. He found a couple of chestnuts on the ground. He picked them up and attempted to scamper up the tree just like the squirrels had done. He wasn't successful and kept sliding back down. Maybe tortoises weren't built for climbing trees. Adrenaline still wanted to help the squirrels, so he took a moment to consider the matter. He came up with an idea. He collected a pile of hazelnuts and acorns and placed them at the bottom of the tree. He began to throw the nuts up to the waiting squirrels. It took a few throws for adrenaline to get the hang of it, but before long, he was throwing the nutty feast successfully up to the waiting paws of the squirrels. Even though he wanted to make sure the squirrels had as much food as they needed, the little tortoise began to get tired, and he couldn't throw the nuts as high. He was quite glad when the squirrels said they had enough food. They thanked Adrenaline for his help. The little tortoise walked on through the forest at a much slower pace. There were still things he wanted to see, and things he wanted to do. The sun continued slowly on its journey through the clear blue sky. Bumblebees flitted from flower to flower. A lavender-scented breeze flowed through sleepy forest. Adrenaline strolled along, looking for something to do. He spotted Hare resting at the side of the forest path. She was reclining on the soft grass with her hands behind her head. Adrenaline smiled. He had seen Hare many times running through the forest with a big smile on her face. Perhaps he could run with her. He wasn't sure he'd be able to go as fast as Hare, but he would go as fast as a tortoise could. He walked over to Hare and was surprised to see her eyes were closed. Was she asleep at this time of day? How peculiar. Adrenaline was about to turn away, but Hare's eyes opened. She looked at the little tortoise and gave him a sleepy smile. Hello there, Adrenaline. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you for asking. He frowned a little. 
Were you asleep, Hare? In the middle of the day? Hare nodded. I was having a nap. I have one every day at about this time. Adrenaline said he had no idea what a nap was. Oh, it's a small, refreshing sleep, she explained. Lots of animals have them. Adrenaline said he never had a nap, and he didn't like the idea of falling asleep in the middle of the day. Hare gave him a gentle smile. He should try having one. It gives your body time to slow down and rest for a while. And it doesn't even need to be a long nap. Just long enough so that you feel rested afterwards and ready to get on with your day. I love having a nap. Adrenaline thought about her words. Maybe I'll try a nap another day. I've got too much to do today. He let out the smallest of yawns. Hare noticed his yawn and said he should get an early night. Adrenaline shook his head. Oh, I've got too much to do. You'll feel better after a good night's sleep. I always do. I have lots of energy when I wake up. You've seen how fast I run through the forest, and that's because I have a good sleep. Hare stopped talking and looked as if she were searching for the right words. Sleeping is like a superpower. A superpower? Adrenaline liked the sound of that. What do you mean? Hare patted the grass next to her and asked Adrenaline to sit down. The little tortoise settled himself next to Hare. He lifted his face and felt the soothing warmth of the sun on his cheeks. Relaxing forest sounds came from all directions. Adrenaline listened to the soothing symphony of nature. He'd never noticed there was such a variety of sounds in Sleepy Forest before. He wriggled his feet inside his shoes and thought how nice it was to take a rest for a while. Hare said to Adrenaline, Sleeping gives your body the time it needs to rest and grow stronger. I always feel amazing when I wake up. I'm ready for anything, and I'm sure I run faster too. I love going to bed early and getting as much sleep as I can. Why don't you try going to bed earlier tonight? Adrenaline was about to say he still had plenty of things to do that day. But he yawned instead. He just couldn't seem to stop himself. Hare continued talking gently to the tired tortoise. The other animals in the forest always go to bed early. And lots of them have naps, too. Perhaps you should talk to them about it. Hare stood up and stretched her arms high above her head. I'm going for a run now. Would you like to join me? Adrenaline normally would have said yes. But his legs were feeling a little weary. So he politely said no and waved to Hare as she jogged away. Adrenaline thought about Hare's words. Was sleep really a superpower? He wanted to know what his forest friends thought about that. He lingered in the warm sun for a while longer 
enjoying the feeling of having nothing to do. After a while, he stood up, wiped some grass off his running shoes, and set off walking again. He went as fast as a tortoise could go, a tortoise who was feeling somewhat tired. Adrenaline decided to revisit the squirrels and talk to them about what Hare had told him. When he reached the squirrel's home, he saw they were nestled cosily in the bough of the tree. Some of them were nibbling on small chunks of chestnuts. Adrenaline called up to them and asked if he could have a chat. Of course, the oldest squirrel said. I'll be down in a second. The squirrel scooted down the tree and arrived at Adrenaline's side. Adrenaline told him about his conversation with Hare and asked if the squirrels ever had naps. We certainly do. Every day. In fact, I've just had one, and I feel marvellous. I love having naps almost as much as I love going to sleep at night. I've got a cosy bed in this tree. It's made out of soft leaves. Adrenaline asked, Do you think sleeping is a superpower? Hare thinks it is. The squirrel smiled and said that was an excellent word to use. And yes, sleep must be a superpower, because he felt fantastic when he woke up after a good night's sleep. The squirrel looked at the tree, a thoughtful expression on his face. When I was little, I couldn't climb this tree. I kept sliding back down. My mum would always tell me to have a good sleep and try again the following day. When I woke up the next day, I was a little better at climbing. Until one day, I climbed all the way to the top. So, yes, I think sleeping must be a superpower. Adrenaline's little eyes grew wide in wonder. If I had lots of early nights, do you think I'd be able to climb your tree? You might, the squirrel smiled at him. Imagine that, climbing our tree all the way to the top. Adrenaline was already imagining that very thing, and a smile spread across his face. He thanked the squirrel for talking to him, and went on his way. Adrenaline walked on, until he came to a stream, where his frog friends were hopping from lily pad to lily pad. He waved to them and asked if they had time for a chat. The youngest frog jumped over to him. Adrenaline told her what Hare had said about sleep being a superpower. The frog nodded her green head enthusiastically. I know it is. She pointed to the lily pads. Last week, I couldn't jump between those lily pads. But now I can, and it must be, because I've had lots of sleep. Adrenaline said he was very impressed. The frog lifted one leg and waggled it in the air. Look, I've grown bigger since last week. Look how long my legs are. She waggled it again. And next week, 
my legs will be even longer and stronger. Adrenaline asked if the frog ever had a nap during the day. Oh yes, every day. I've got a snuggly spot by the water. I love having a nap. But I like my sleep even more. Will you come back next week and see how much I've grown again? Adrenaline promised to do so. The frog tilted her head and looked more closely at the tortoise. She said, If you get lots of sleep and lots of naps, you can use your superpower to leap across the lily pads like me. Imagine that, Adrenaline said with a smile. A leaping tortoise. He said goodbye to the young frog and went on his way. It wasn't long before he came to the tree where the caterpillars were resting. They were lounging sleepily on the branches, contented smiles on their faces. Adrenaline noticed they weren't eating and asked if they'd run out of leaves. One of the caterpillars yawned and said, We've eaten all we need to. It's time for our big sleep soon. Adrenaline wasn't sure what the caterpillar meant by that, and asked her to explain. The caterpillar yawned again, before saying, In a caterpillar's life, there's a time to eat, and there's a time to sleep. And it's nearly time for our big sleep. It's when we turn into butterflies. Are you sure you don't want any more leaves? I can get some for you. No, thank you. All I want to do now is close my eyes and fall into a deep, deep sleep. Good night, my kind friend. I'll see you again when I wake up. The caterpillar closed her eyes and pulled her cosy cocoon around herself. Seeing her look so restful and happy made Adrenaline want to be in his bed with his cosy cover around him. He yawned and blinked tiredly. He started to head home. Thoughts of his snuggly, cosy bed filled his mind, causing him to yawn some more. On the way home, he went by the area where the birds had started their dawn chorus that day. The rooster, with a plume of purple tail feathers, was resting beneath an oak tree, a relaxed smile on his face. A sleepy tiredness came over adrenaline, and he asked the rooster if he could sit with him for a while. Of course, my friend. The rooster's voice was deep and soothing. Tell me about your day. You always seem to be off somewhere. Adrenaline told the rooster what he'd been doing. He finished by telling him about hair and the conversations he'd had with the squirrel, the frog and the caterpillar. The rooster nodded, a wise look on his face. It's true, sleeping is very good for you. And there's something else too. 
Something magical happens when you're asleep. Your mind is free to imagine whatever it wants. Adrenaline wasn't sure what that meant and asked the rooster to explain. The rooster gazed dreamily into the distance and said, When I fall asleep, I often get ideas for new songs. The words come to me in dreams. When I wake up, I remember the songs and I write them down in a notebook. The other birds do that too. It's amazing what happens in your dreams. It's like being transported into another world, a magical world, where anything is possible. Adrenaline loved the thought of being transported into a magical world. He said, Do you think I will get ideas in my dreams too? Of course. The rooster smiled at the little tortoise. I had a nap earlier and came up with a new song whilst I was asleep. Would you like to hear it? Adrenaline nodded in his deep and soothing voice. The rooster began to sing. His beautiful melody filled the air and wrapped itself around adrenaline like a comforting hug. The tortoise felt all warm inside and he felt tired too. He began to yawn again. His eyes started to feel heavier and heavier. The sun dipped towards the horizon, and the sky turned a darker shade of blue. When the rooster had finished his lovely lullaby, Adrenaline said, I'd better be getting home. I'm so very tired, and I'm ready for my bed. Thank you for singing to me. I loved your song. Good night. Good night, little one. Sweet dreams. The rooster started up his song again, and the soothing melody drifted on the air and kept adrenaline company on his short walk home. The tired tortoise soon arrived home. He took off his shoes and put them away. He brushed his teeth, washed his face, and got into his pyjamas. He snuggled down in his comfy, cosy bed and pulled the cover up to his chin. He sighed happily. He imagined his friends in Sleepy Forest settling down to sleep too. He smiled sleepily as he thought about his body growing stronger in the night and the magical dreams that were waiting for him. He let out a long long yawn. Adrenaline, the tired tortoise, fell into a deep, deep sleep. This is The Moon Cat's Pajama Party by Susanna McLaughlin. It was a warm, still summer evening when Pumpkin and Picasso had the idea. 
They'd been living together for a few weeks at the time. Their family had gone to the theatre, leaving the two cats to do what they did best, slob around in their pyjamas, stretching and rolling around and kneading the cushions. Picasso rubbed his black splodged side against a chair's leg and rolled over onto his back, exposing his little pink tummy amongst clouds of white fur. Pumpkin yawned. Another evening in, she said. What a treat. Do you think it's nearly time ooh, to put our pyjamas on? Picasso nodded. He tilted his head and grinned. Isn't it fun living with your bestest friend, he said. Pumpkin rolled her eyes. She pretended she didn't like it when Picasso got mushy like that. Actually, Flo's my best friend, she said. You're just my best cat friend. Picasso grinned and crossed his eyes. That was fine with him. He had Maisie, too. He understood that Pumpkin got protective of Flo. The connection between a kid and a cat was hard to beat. It's really, really nice having company, Picasso said. Cats should hang out more. Pumpkin nodded. Before I knew you, I used to hiss at the cats in the neighbourhood. I thought them all rather suspicious. But they're probably all right, really. Do you think we could throw a party? Picasso asked. We could get a bunch of cats around and we could have a sleepover, like Flo and Maisie do with their friends. Pumpkin scratched her chin. I like that, she said. We can't, though. How can we send emails when we're too short to reach the post box? If only there was a magic wand we could wave to magic them all here. Anyway, shall we put our pyjamas on? Little did the cats know that there was a creature in the garden quite capable of making their dreams come true. A little silver squirrel who glinted in the light of the rising moon. He was sitting on the fence, just outside the open window. Hearing their words, he rubbed his little paws together with a giggle and pranced off up a tree branch to who knows where to make their dreams come true. Pumpkin and Picasso were just finishing changing into their pyjamas when there was a knock-knock at the door. They looked at one another, puzzled. Must be the wrong door, Pumpkin said, putting on her warm, fuzzy socks. Picasso nodded and held two pairs of pyjamas up for her to see. Which one's tonight? he asked. Pumpkin scratched her chin, looking at the blue onesie decorated with rocket ships and the lilac button-up suit with an ice cream cone emblazoned on the chest. She pointed to the ice cream set. Those ones, she said. There was another knock at the door. Picasso rolled his eyes, buttoning up his pyjamas. Coming, he called. He popped the cat flap open with his paw to see two cats standing just outside. Although he couldn't see their faces, piled up in their paws were casserole dishes, cake boxes and cardboard containers that smelt suspiciously sugary and delicious. Hello, hello, called two little voices. It's us. Potato and beans. Pumpkin looked at Picasso in alarm. She'd never met a potato before or a beans. They have strange names, she whispered to Picasso. Who gets named after vegetables like that? Picasso looked at Pumpkin pointedly, but she didn't pick up on his drift. We got your invite, the voice came from the little white fluff ball of a cat on the right. Pajama party, right? Pumpkin looked at the newcomer's outfits. They were indeed dressed in striped and starred pajamas, with the trouser legs stuffed into shining cowboy boots. Picasso grinned. 
He didn't know what magic sent the invitation, but he wasn't going to question it. Oh, yes, he grinned. Pajama party. Come on in. The cats manoeuvred all their packages through the cat flap and set the banquet down on the table, finally able to grin at the two cats and give them a hug. They introduced themselves properly as Potato and Beans, the owners of a roller skate diner way out in the middle of nowhere, USA. Pumpkin and Picasso raised their eyebrows, impressed. They introduced themselves as the pets of Flo and Maisie from Number 62 Cherry Grove Way, and the cat seemed delighted to meet them. Potato and Beans told them that they'd taken it upon themselves to prepare the midnight snacks, pulling lids and foil off the containers to show crispy mac and cheese, a small canister of their favourite soup, and box upon box of sweet treats. Mrs Pig got a little carried away in the kitchen, Beans chuckled. You don't say, Picasso laughed. Midnight snack, this is a midnight feast. He and Pumpkin began taste-testing the food, egged on by the diner cats, nibbling a bite of every single dish. Each seemed more delicious than the last. We'll never be able to eat all this on our own, Pumpkin said. Just then, there was another knock at the door. The four cats looked at each other, raising an eyebrow. It seemed there was something quite magic going on. They gathered around the door to peer through the cat flap once more. Standing on the patio, sniffing a potted plant, was a little tiny kitten. She squealed with excitement as the flap opened, and another kitten appeared behind her. A nutmeg, she said. This is my friend Donna. The other kitten waggled her paw in hello. Nutmeg was wrapped up in a white fluffy dressing gown, and Donna was wearing a matching one in sky blue. The cats beamed and welcomed them in through the cat flap. The flap had barely swung closed when there was another knock. This time there was a whole host of cats on the doorstep. There was a black and white cat who twinkled with magic, whose name tag read Minnie. There was a pair of ginger and white cats giggling and calling each other Ginger and Snowy. And finally, there was a black cat who was talking on a cell phone, telling someone named Talia that they'd be back in the morning. Every one of them was wearing pyjamas. Picasso and Pumpkin welcomed them all in, shaking their paws and giving them hugs. They looked around. Now this was quite the party. The cats spent some time getting to know each other, and Pumpkin gave them a tour of the house, showing the place in the larder she liked to sleep amongst the onions, and the laundry basket that was always the warmest, and the patch of grass in the garden that she thought smelt really nice. Picasso pulled as many blankets as he could into the lounge, until every single surface was covered with soft, fluffy or woolly, cuddly softness. Once the introductions and tour concluded, the cats took their places in the lounge, wrapped up warm and wiggling their toes in their fluffy slippers. What shall we do now? I've never been to a pyjama party before. Little Nutmeg purred from her spot by the fire. The other cat shrugged. It seemed none of them had. Picasso clapped his hands. Maisie and Flo love watching TV shows with kids having sleepovers. We know exactly what to do. Pumpkin nodded and explained that usually, on the TV, the girls would pamper themselves. Then they'd do prank calls. Then they'd dance and sing. Then a midnight snack. She winked at Potato and Beans. First up then, Picasso said. Let's pamper. The cats sprung into action. Beans took a cucumber from the fridge 
and sliced it into cooling little circles to put over their eyes. Potato filled the washing up bowl with warm soapy water for them to dip their paws in, making a bubble beard while she waited to make Nutmeg and Donna laugh. Pumpkin and Picasso took the others to Maisie and Flo's room, where they picked through their cupboards, pulling out little bottles of shiny, sparkly nail varnish. Then the kitten spa was ready. The cats wrapped towels on their heads like turbans, as Snowy said she'd seen that happen on a spa leaflet that once came in the post. They soaked their toes in the warm, frothy water and got comfy on the sofa, painting one another's claws. The one who wasn't painting would pop cool cucumbers on their eyes and lean back to relax. Minnie was really good at the painting and could do little moons and stars over the glitter. Bella suspected she was using a little magic to keep it neat. Picasso had his claws painted blue and Minnie said it complimented his eyes beautifully. Beans and potato went with red to match their jammies and nutmeg decided on rainbow, as she couldn't possibly choose. Ginger retrieved the hairdryer from the bathroom and held it over the cat's claws to make sure the paint dried without smudges, and then held the hairdryer over their fur, simply because the warm air felt so lovely. Once they'd all been pampered and were feeling very soft and relaxed, Pumpkin consulted their activity list. Next, prank calls. The cats spent a little while mulling over who to prank. They didn't know any numbers off by heart. Ginger pulled out a pizza menu that was wedged under the doormat and brought it to the group. Let's prank a human, she said. The cats giggled at the idea, but only one of them believed they could pull it off. They turned to Bella, the talking cat, who was lucky enough to be given the magical gift of being understood by humans, and began chanting her name. Bella took the telephone and held it to her ear, trying to stop giggling as she typed in the number. She asked the man who answered whether she could order a pizza. And he said, yes, of course. And what would she like as a topping? Bella couldn't stop herself from laughing as she answered, cat food. The man laughed and Bella laughed too. And the two of them laughed together until Bella said she was only kidding and wished him a good evening. The cats were all giggling on the carpet as laughter is quite contagious and they all chuckled and chortled and cackled for a while longer before they finally settled down. Pumpkin picked up her list and marked the box next to prank call with a big tick. What's next? Snowy asked. Pumpkin grinned. Dancing, she said. Before she finished the word, Picasso had already hit the lights, switched on the record player and turned the disco ball to twinkle mode. The cats cast aside their blankets and began to moonwalk, boogie and strut over to the centre of the room. Picasso disappeared and reappeared with items from Flo and Maisie's dressing up box, heart and star-shaped sunglasses, feather boas, cowboy hats and plastic tiaras. Soon, they all looked like stars. They each had their moment on the dance floor. Nutmeg and Donna showed off a dance routine that they had made at school, sliding along the floor and spinning, and ending up back to back with their paws crossed over their chest, peering through two big novelty sunglasses. Potato and Beans coached the cats through some line dancing, kicking their boots and clapping and calling yee-haw as they stepped this way and that. Ginger and Snowy weren't so talented at dancing and kept accidentally crashing together and giggling belly bounces and falling about laughing. 
pumpkin gave a surprisingly well-rehearsed pop star routine, swishing around her feather boa and singing into a hairbrush. She grinned sheepishly as the others applauded and confessed she and Flo had spent a whole weekend learning it from a music video. Picasso did a funny impression of a ballerina with a tiara on his head, and Bella did disco dancing, rolling her paws around one another and pointing from one corner of the room to the other, striking poses with a cool-as-a-cucumber expression on her face. It was down to Minnie to do her solo, and the cats clapped for her to take centre stage, but she shook her head coyly. I don't want to perform a dance, she said. She looked a little nervous that the other cats would push her to do it anyway, but her kind friends barely blinked, saying, That's okay, Minnie, and boogieing next to her. But, she added nervously, I, I could show you some magic. The cat's eyes lit up, and they all said they would love that. Picasso led her to the dressing-up box, and when they returned, Minnie was sporting a top hat and held a magic wand in hand, topped with a big gold star. The cats were waiting patiently, sitting and waiting for Minnie to begin. She felt a wave of nerves, but soon took in each cat's encouraging smile, took a big breath and let out a grin. With a wave of her tail, she created a bunch of flowers in soft oranges and pinks. The cats all oohed and awed at the beautiful blooms. As they watched, the flowers began to lift from the bouquet and float and twirl in the air. Their soft perfume filled the room. Minnie waved her paws and a twinkling fog swept across the ceiling, like a blanket of cloud dotted with stars. Little shimmering planets appeared suspended in the room, rotating on their axis. Little mini fireworks streaked through the air like little shooting stars. A twisty, turny smudge of the Milky Way appeared in midair and little cloud figures in the shape of cats seemed to be floating around swimming and lapping from its milky streams. Then it all disappeared into the top hat Minnie lifted from her head. The cats didn't clap for a moment. They were too stunned. Their little mouths hung open and their eyes seemed to fill with dreams. Then Nutmeg began to clap, and they all took off whooping and congratulating Minnie on her amazing talent. Little circles of pink blush appeared on Minnie's cheeks. Once she'd basked in their praise for a moment more, Minnie took Picasso's list from the side table. Next up, she said, it was time for their midnight snack. Potato and beans whizzed to the kitchen, setting up their feast with a practiced ease, throwing tablecloths and cutlery between them and seeming to arrange the food in the most beautiful of ways so it looked even more bountiful than when stacked up in its tens of boxes. Dinner, Potato said, twirling an imaginary moustache. Is served, she bowed like a fancy waiter, and the cat streamed into the kitchen, loading up plates with all sorts of delights. They crunched on nachos and popcorn, slurped soup and milkshake, and gobbled down cookies and plump strawberries. They drank fizzy pop, laughing when Nutmeg let out a little burp, and ended with a glass of warm milk each to settle the stomach. Once they'd finished, they were all looking a little plumper and patting their round bellies in satisfaction. 
They thanked Potato and Beans, who insisted it was all down to their chef, Mrs Pig, and said they'd pass on their compliments. What's the last thing on the list? Ginger asked Picasso, who consulted the scrap of paper and smiled. It's to get ready for bed and whisper secrets as we fall asleep, he replied. The cats giggled. That sounded nice. There was a queue by the bathroom sink as the cats took turns to brush their teeth. One by one, they returned to the lounge and selected a blanket and cushion to sink into. Soon they were each curled up in their own spot, and all you could see was a carpet of snoozy cats. Pumpkin turned off the lamp and turned on the nightlight, and there were rustles and yawns as the cats got comfortable. Do we share secrets now? Donna's little voice yawned. Picasso said yes, now was the time. Donna said, Once I tried dog food, and I liked it. Little giggles filled the room. Potato chimed up. When I'm sleepy sometimes, I suck my thumb. Beans grinned and said it was true. Ginger spoke up in the darkness and said, Sometimes I get nervous before I come to parties. I get a little bit scared that I won't know what to say and do or how to make friends. But I had so much fun tonight. There were happy murmurs amongst the cats as they told her that she needn't worry and some confessed that they felt that way sometimes too. Pumpkin, who was next to Ginger, gave her a little cuddle and told her how happy and proud of her she was that she came, even though she felt scared. They said they thought she was perfect just the way she was. Ginger drifted off with a smile on her face. One by one, the cat's eyelids drooped, and they drifted into sleep. Soon, only the sound of soft purrs and snores filled the room. Not long after, the front door opened, and Flo and her dad, Maisie and her mum, all crept into the lounge. Expecting to see only Pumpkin and Picasso curled up in their usual yin-yang, They were surprised by the cuddly puddle of cats that they found at their feet. But they just smiled, whispered sweet dreams, and went upstairs to put on their own pyjamas and drift off to sleep. Somewhere out in the garden, a little silver squirrel smiled, pleased to have done such good work once again, and drifted off to sleep tucked up in his nook in an old oak tree. The next morning, the cats would wake up to fluffy pancakes topped with blueberries and patted around in their slippers, drinking hot cocoa before heading back to their homes, from sleepy forest to the middle of nowhere. But even though they lived far apart, They had made fast friends and were sure that it wouldn't be long before they saw one another again. Have you ever seen a unicorn for yourself? If you have then you can count yourself as one of the fortunate ones. Unicorns are beautiful, magical animals that live in the heart of mystical lands, such as Sleepy Forest. Unicorns look just like horses, except they have a range of unique characteristics that set them apart from the horses we see in our countryside fields. For a start, unicorns are much bigger than the horses we see every day. Unicorns are so large and majestic, 
that they can carry the likes of bears and lions around on their backs if they so wish. Unicorns love showing off how strong they are by giving lifts to other creatures. They are sort of like the personal taxis of the mystical kingdom. They can run at almost lightning speeds with their long, muscly legs and get to go wherever they need to be in next to no time. Unicorns do not have boring coats. In fact, unicorns come in all the colours of the rainbow. You might see a bright pink unicorn chatting to a sunny yellow unicorn whilst relaxing by a lake. Or you might even spot a midnight blue unicorn racing with an emerald green unicorn through the forest. Yep, unicorns really stand out from the crowd. Some unicorns have wings and can fly through the sky, but most of them remain on the ground. Their long tails can also come in all sorts of shimmering colours. The really lucky ones have multicoloured tails, but all are equally beautiful. But the main way that you can identify a unicorn from the rest of the four-legged animals of our world is by spotting their impressive horns. All unicorns have a long, majestic horn that pokes out of their forehead. A unicorn's magic is held within their horn, which is why their horns sparkle and shimmer with enchanted light. Unicorn horns can grow in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They start off being teeny tiny when a unicorn is born. But as they grow bigger and bigger, their horn grows bigger and bigger too. Some unicorns have twirly horns, some have straight and narrow ones, and others have horns that spiral and coil up into a point. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and colours too. Unicorns possess lots of magical powers. Along with their super speed and great strength, they provide good luck and fortune to everyone they meet. And they also have healing powers. If you fell over and scraped your knee, then a unicorn could magically make your knee as good as new again. Or if you had a bad cough, a unicorn could magically make it disappear. Because of their healing powers, the unicorns regularly travel around spreading their good luck and healing powers to as many people as possible. Unicorns are very special creatures. When a new child is born into the world, the world becomes a better place. Children are full of so much love and magic that they make the sun shine that little bit brighter. The plants grow a little bit taller and make every living creature on the planet feel a little bit happier. So when Fenella the unicorn was born, the world became a better place just by her being in it. Fenella was born on a cool spring day on the outskirts of Sleepy Forest. Her parents were so excited to meet her for the first time, and they invited all of their friends to meet her in the meadow where they lived. Everybody gathered around to meet the newborn unicorn and waited for Fenella to be revealed. Fenella's mother proudly introduced her baby to the group. Fenella was adorable, and everybody sighed with adoration at the sight of her. Fenella's coat was a soft pink colour, and she had a long, shiny, glittering silver tail. Her horn was rainbow-coloured, and twirled to a pointed tip, just like ice cream on a cone. 
Fenella pranced about the feet of the towering grown-up unicorns excitedly. She hadn't seen so many of her kind before, and she was delighted to meet them all. Isn't she a darling? Althea, the purple unicorn, gushed, watching Fenella trot around. Yes, she is. Noelani, the white unicorn, agreed, before adding, But doesn't she seem a bit on the small side? Fenella's mother was taken aback. She hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary about her newborn daughter. She's a baby. Of course she's small. Fenella's mother defended her daughter. She will grow up to be just as big as everybody else. Don't you worry. Baby Fenella gazed up at the tall and regal unicorns around her and smiled with glee. She couldn't wait to grow up and one day be as lofty and as impressive as everybody else. However, as the years passed, Fenella came to realise that things weren't going quite to plan. Instead of growing up to be large just like everybody else, Fenella was somehow remaining the same tiny size. She just didn't grow. While all the other children were getting taller every day, Fenella was staying the same miniature size. She was desperate to grow bigger so that she could carry out the same unicorn duties as everybody else. But due to her small size, she couldn't help out. She was too small to carry any of the forest animals on her back and she was too slow to keep up with the other unicorns running their errands. She didn't possess enough healing magic within her to help out the large animals of Sleepy Forest, and she couldn't even pull the carts of fruit and supplies with the other unicorns because she wasn't strong enough. Fenella felt positively helpless. Fenella tried every way she could think of to make herself grow bigger. She ate extra portions at dinner. She did her stretches every day and she wished on the stars every single night. But no matter how hard she wished or how much she tried, Fenella stayed the same tiny size. She was beginning to think that she wasn't destined to be a normal unicorn like everybody else. Fenella's mother didn't know what to do either. She tried feeding Fenella lots of vegetables to help her grow big and strong, but it didn't seem to be making much difference. She even tried using her healing powers on Fenella to help her bones grow bigger, but to no avail. It seemed that Fenella was destined to be a miniature unicorn forever. After years of trying and failing to grow bigger, Fenella and her mother decided that it was time to face the facts. Fenella was probably never going to be a large unicorn, so she had to accept herself for the pint-sized pony that she was. Fenella accepted this, but she was adamant that her small stature wouldn't hold her back any longer. She might not be able to do as much as the other unicorns, but she would do her best to keep up. 
One day, Fenella's friends, Zelda, Flynn and Aslan, were heading towards Sleepy Forest to carry out their duties for the day. A tree that a family of birds lived in had fallen down in the middle of the forest. Zelda, Flynn and Aslan had been instructed to push the tree back upright in time for nightfall so that the birds could be back in their tree again in time for bed. Fenella followed her friends as they approached the entrance to Sleepy Forest at the edge of their meadow. For every long step that they took, Fenella had to take four tiny fast steps just to keep up. Can I come with you and help? Fenella pleaded with her friends. Zelda sighed and replied, We would love for you to come, Fenella, but you won't be able to keep up with us. We only have a limited amount of time to fix the tree, and it's all the way in the middle of Sleepy Forest. We will have to run there, and you won't be able to keep up with us. Despite Zelda's rational explanation, Fenella was still determined to join her friends. Please, Fenella begged. I'll try and keep up, I promise. And if I can't keep up, then you can just go on without me. I won't be annoyed. Zelda, Flynn and Aslan all looked at each other for support. They didn't want to leave their friend behind, but they also had an important task on their hoofs. Eventually, they gave in to Fenella's request. Okay, Fenella, you can come with us, Flynn appeased her. But we can't wait for you, so you'll have to keep up with our pace. Fenella leapt for joy. She was delighted to get to join her friends on a mission. Her rainbow horn began to gleam with bright, multicoloured light. Her horn always did that when she was happy. OK, then, let's go, Fenella commanded, leading the way into Sleepy Forest. At first, Fenella did well to keep up with her friends as they trotted off into the depths of the forest. She was lagging behind a little, but she could still see her friends clearly as they darted in and out of all the trees. But after some time, Fenella found herself growing weary, and her little legs couldn't take it much longer. Keep up, Fenella, Aslan called out from far ahead. But... Aslan's voice quickly faded out as he, Zelda and Flynn zoomed off further into the forest, leaving Fenella behind, gasping for breath. Fenella decided to rest by a tree and catch her breath. She had done very well to keep up this far, but she had to admit defeat. Fenella just wasn't built in the same way as her friends, so she couldn't do the same things that they could. Fenella was beginning to wonder if she would ever be good enough to do anything to help others. Fenella took a deep breath and slowly sighed. She felt much better now that she had stopped for a break. When she was ready, she would make her way back out of Sleepy Forest and enjoy a leisurely stroll. Fenella preferred to take things slow anyway. 
it meant that she could take the time to appreciate everything around her more. She would feel much better once she was back in the meadow again. Once Fenella's heartbeat had slowed down, she stood back up and began her journey through Sleepy Forest, back to the meadow. As she plodded along, she gazed at all of the giant trees that soared all the way up to the sky and listened to the birds singing in the trees and the owls hooting in their nests. She admired the beautiful beds of flowers down on her level and stooped to smell the lilies. They smelt delightful. Fenella closed her eyes and took a deep sniff of the flowers. All of a sudden, she felt something tickle the end of her nose. She opened her eyes and was amused to see a little bumblebee had landed there. Oh, hello, Fenella greeted the fuzzy little bumblebee. The bumblebee waved its teeny hand at her and tucked its wings in lazily. I'm sorry if I've disturbed you, the bumblebee responded. I'm just so tired from buzzing around all day and your nose looked like the perfect place to stop and rest for a while. Fenella giggled at the bumblebee's unexpected arrival. It's all right, she replied. You're very welcome to rest on me if you're tired. The bumblebee thanked Fenella and introduced herself. The bumblebee was called Babs and Fenella could see that Babs was carrying around two big bags of pollen on the back of her legs. They must be pretty heavy for such a little bug, Vanella thought to herself. Where do you live? Vanella asked the weary bug. Babs the bumblebee explained that she lived in a hive with all the rest of her family and friends, not too far away. Would you like me? To give you a lift home, Vanella offered kindly. Oh, yes, please, Babs replied gratefully. I'm so tired. I don't think I could carry all of this pollen back to the hive by myself. Vanella stood up, tall and proud and asked Babs to guide the way back to her hive. Babs remained perched on the tip of Fenella's nose and led the way for Fenella to take her home. Fenella felt giddy. This was the first time that she had ever given a lift to another creature. She was far too small to carry the animals that the rest of the unicorns regularly taxied around. But Babs the bumblebee was the perfect size for Fenella to carry with ease. Fenella carried Babs all the way home to her hive. Thank you very much, Fenella. Bab said gratefully as she gazed up at her hive in the tree. I'm glad I bumped into a unicorn today. You guys are always so helpful. Fenella sighed and bowed her head in embarrassment. I'm not a very good unicorn, Fenella admitted disappointedly. I'm too small to carry anyone around or help out. I just get in the way. 
Babs looked into Fenella's eyes and frowned. I don't believe that for a second, Babs commented. You are clearly a very good unicorn. Everybody forgets about creatures like me because we're so small. But we need help, just like the bigger animals. You just helped me out when I was in need. I think that makes you an excellent unicorn, just like all the others. Fenella smiled, and her heart lit up with hope. Perhaps she could be useful after all. Just because she wasn't big enough to help the larger animals of the forest, that didn't mean that she couldn't help out the small ones instead. Babs the bumblebee said goodbye to Fenella and then flew away up to her beehive, carrying her heavy bags of pollen at her side. When she landed at the door to the hive, she turned around one last time and waved to Fenella before disappearing inside. Fenella paused for a few moments and thought about what Babs had said. If the bigger unicorns were focusing on helping all the large animals, Maybe they couldn't see that the small ones needed help too. Maybe Fenella could be the helping hand that the smaller animals needed. Fenella wandered around the forest in search of other small animals. She passed a lion called Leo, but he was far too big for Fenella to carry. She also met a bear named Lana, who had stubbed her toe on a log, but she was too big for Fenella to help out too. Fenella was struggling to find any other animal. They must either be hiding or too tiny to spot. Then, just as Fenella Almost given up hope, she heard a wheezy squeak come from inside a bush. Hello? Is anyone there? Fenella called out into the thick bush. She heard the wheezy squeak again and saw the leaves begin to rustle. A little hedgehog emerged from the bottom of the bush, coughing and spluttering, and holding a handkerchief in its hand. Don't come too close, the hedgehog sniffed. I've got a cold, and I don't want you to catch it. The hedgehog appeared to be really struggling, with his bad cough and runny nose. The hedgehog held his handkerchief and blew his nose as hard as he could. So hard, in fact, that his whole body shuddered with the blustering pressure. This was a perfect opportunity for Fenella to test out her healing powers. She had never been able to heal another animal before on the account of them all being too large. But surely, her magic would be enough to help out this little hedgehog. Fenella closed her eyes and focused. Her rainbow horn began to glitter and shine with magical light. Then, the little hedgehog, started to magically glow, too. What is happening? The hedgehog croaked, before letting out a long cough. 
Fenella felt all warm and fuzzy inside. She felt the magic flow through her and out of the tip of her horn. When she opened her eyes, she saw that the hedgehog was standing still in amazement. His nose was no longer blocked and runny, and his voice was no longer croaky and hoarse, with not a single cough in sight. Wow, the hedgehog gasped. You healed my cold? I didn't think that unicorns helped small animals like us. Fenella laughed charmingly. <laughs> we help all animals, big or small, she replied. The hedgehog was very grateful for her healing help and offered her his snotty hanky as a gesture of thanks. She politely declined the offer and wandered back off through Sleepy Forest in search of more small creatures to assist. She bumped into a slithering snail who was on his way to a party. I'm late, the snow-paced snail cried with dismay. I'm going to miss playing past the parcel. Fenella offered to give the snail a lift on her back to the party, and in next to no time she had carried him across the way to where his friend's birthday celebrations were underway. It was only a very short journey for Fenella, and took her only two minutes to walk there. But for the snail, that would have been a very long journey indeed. He would have definitely missed the party, if it weren't for Fenella helping him out. She also helped a mouse called Millie carry her shopping home. Fenella was turning into somewhat of a taxi for the smaller animals of the forest, and she loved it. She finally felt like she had a purpose. The other unicorns might be able to help the larger animals of the forest, but Fenella could help the smaller ones that everyone else had forgotten about. They needed help just as much as the big animals. Fenella returned home to the meadow that evening with a new spring in her step. She told her mother all about the animals she had helped that day and her mother couldn't have been prouder. And when Fenella bumped into her friend Zelda Flynn and Aslan, she stopped them in their tracks as they tried to apologise for leaving her behind. If they hadn't gone on ahead, then she never would have discovered what she could do and found her own path. She was grateful to them for giving her the chance to join them. From then on, Fenella's main unicorn duties became helping out the small animals of Sleepy Forest, while the bigger unicorns raced around in a mad dash, assisting the giant animals, as they always did. Fenella took her time tending to the tiny animals that everyone else had forgotten about. Everyone admired Fenella for her forward thinking and care. The small animals were all very grateful for her, and the larger unicorns were all very impressed by her. Fenella didn't let her miniature size hold her back from finding her purpose. She just had to make her own path 
and get to know her own strengths rather than striving to match others. Fenella the tiny unicorn had never felt prouder to be exactly who she was. Even small creatures can make a big impact in their own ways.